Yeah, hello and welcome to a new episode of the weekly Spielworks chat, episode oh, season two. So already first mistake in the in the first seven, my, uh, sentence. My name is Uli Blenemann and I'm having a guest today. It's Volko Runki, the famous designer. And welcome, Ho Volko. How are you? Uh, thank you, Uli. Thanks for having me. I am uh, happily very well. All here is good. So this sounds uh, excellent. So we will talk today about Volko's creation, the coin series for GMT games. And um, I will briefly post a URL here because so that you can see all the games that so far appeared in this series and all the games that right now are works in progress. So let me briefly quickly do this and then we can continue here. So you should see this one. This is from the GMT website. And um, Volko, please tell us briefly a little about a bit, bit about yourself and about your background. Uh, sure. I'm a um, re retired U.S. Uh, federal employee. I worked in the intelligence community for several decades. And I've also been a nearly lifelong um, board gamer coming out of the traditional board war gaming world of, of the 1970s, Avalon Hill, SBI, and so forth. And I've been doing um, freelance uh, game design for GMT games for about the last two decades, starting with a card-driven game called Wilderness mm -hmm. War, mm -hmm. and most recently, uh, Levian campaign series games about medieval operations. Mm, wonderful. And let me briefly um, say hello to a few people from the chat. So hello, Mo. Hello to Texas. And then Steffen. Of, this is not as far. This is just Be Becherbach, uh, Germany. But also hello to Munich, uh, Christoph. And there is hello Friedberg. So several people here, several towns from all over the world. And Volko, I have a question. Why did you start this series. So what got you interested in the first game in the coin series? So the coin series or counterinsurgency series, um, it comes from several, several origins, but most immediately it was a development of what I wanted to do after a, a two player CDG that I had done, Labyrinth, the War on Terror. Uh -huh. And in that it was the global struggle between the jihadists, international jihadists, uh, and uh, a U.S.-led anti-terrorist, counter-terrorist coalition. And inside that game is, is the idea, if not explicitly stated, that global jihadism, I mean, it, we call them terrorists, but terrorism is a tactic. So from a strategy point of view, it's an insurgency. It, it was an insurgency trying to establish new forms of government through many tools, including terror. And so I was already interested and I wanted to bring that out to the surface and just look at insurgency itself as an animal, if you like, and uh, do that at the national rather than international level. And so I needed a new um, uh, set of mechanics, a new game system to do that mm -hmm. because that was not something that was commonly found um, in the hobby, although there were such by Brian Train, for example. Mm -hmm. And I already knew that I wanted a series because there were so many such cases. Insurgency, in fact, is more common than national yeah. wars, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but the hobby was focused on these big national war, international, international wars. So I thought I would do four games, starting with the one set in Colombia, which became Andy and Abyss. Hmm. Interesting. So, so um, I, I did not know that you really saw it as a series uh, right uh, from the start. But it's also good that GMT immediately said, yes, we, we want to do a, a series uh, on, on these uh, topics. So, so very interesting. So and yeah. I'm, I'm seeing a, a couple of more people here. It's Steve from the US, it's Nicholas, it's Tony and, and Chris from the UK also, although Tony is saying hello from the disunited kingdom. So we are now. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Probably okay. is, is true. So, but you mentioned the term insurgency and counterinsurgency um, here, uh, Volko. So, what does counterinsurgency mean after all? What, what, what is this? What is a counterinsurgency? So, a counterinsurgency, of course, is the, the strategy that a principally an existing government is using to defend itself against the opposing strategy. And that's what insurgency is it's a strategy, yeah. um, which is to 
um, is to change the, typically to change the government. It's typically a, an insurgency that is trying to create a revolution to overthrow one government and replace it with another. But we can also think of reactionary insurgents, mm -hmm. um, even commercial insurgents, and there's a whole categorization in the literature. But they are all using ways of, of influencing especially popular support for their movement and against their opponents, against the government, typically. And these ways um, that they use include violent and nonviolent means. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to, starting from typically very little resources, very little firepower for the insurgents compared to the mm -hmm. government, to slowly build up and uh, attrit, wear mm -hmm. down the government's strength, and, and both through military, political, and economic means, undermine that popular support that is the basis for building that military force within that, that area until the revolutionary forces, uh, in the case of a revolutionary insurgency, become strong enough to directly overthrow the government and replace it. Mm. And so that's insurgency. And so the government has, uh, the governments of the world who are faced with those challenges have developed their own counter strategy to, to fight against that. Mm. Um, and, and this, by the way, is something that went on through the ages. You can go into ancient mm -hmm. times and find very similar cases. But in the modern context, we call that insurgency and counterinsurgency. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. And um, do you think in, in your games, in the games of the coin uh, series, um, the military or the non-military, so the civilian elements, which are the ones that are more important? Or do you think that they are represented both in, in, in the games, or how do you see this? So I, I try to represent them both. Um, however, the, certainly the, the military ways and means, tools and assets are at the forefront. Mm -hmm. And this is because we, we are talking about insurgencies that are chosen as topics, such as what Colombia faced uh, in the case of my game during the 1990s yeah. mm -hmm. is when it's focused at a stage where the insurgents already have quite a bit of military force and the government is pushing back with military force. Mm -hmm. So that is going on. It is a war game in that regard. It's mm -hmm. an internal war. Mm -hmm. uh, force, including terrorism and guerrilla warfare mm -hmm. and ultimately even conventional warfare, mobile operations, if the insurgents are successful enough, these are very, very important tools yeah. in the strategy. There's no question. At the same time, the, the political aspects of these conflicts tend to come out more forcefully be, because of the nature of the strategy and the fact that it is a civil and an internal war. You need political influence over populations to give you the resources, now economics, to de develop the forces to use those military tools. Right. Because you can't just do terrorism forever. That doesn't get you there. Ultimately, right. you have to build up more force. So. What's for me so interesting about modeling and gaming insurgency and counterinsurgency is how interwoven the military, political, and economic tools really are. Hmm. Interesting, yeah. And this is certainly one of the factors for the success of the, the series. But one thing that, in my opinion, stands out in all coin games is this brilliant card mechanic. So how did you come up with this card mechanic? So this was for me a development of and a reaction to card driven games as mm -hmm. we understood them, you know, over the last, you know, 30 years, um, which are wonderful because the cards allow you to, you know, very handily break rules in the moment because mm -hmm. you have the rules exception right in front of you mm -hmm. in the card. And in a classic CDG interweave action menus, operations you can do with, let's say, a number that's on the card or a specific event right, that's going to apply right there. So I wanted to keep all of that. It was the design space I was working in with Wilderness War and with Labyrinth. But I became a little bit um, disenchanted with the fact that you have a hand of cards mm -hmm. and hand management becomes very important to play. Yes. Now that can be fun. It, it, hand management is, mm -hmm. is, is, is engaging, mm -hmm. there's no question. But it removes you a little bit from the, the situation that you're modeling. It's mm -hmm. just another sort of abstraction of what's happening. And I wanted to bring players focus a little bit back more on the situation on the board. Where are the forces? Where is the popular support in the country? 
Um, what is the geography of it? How are things maneuvering and so forth? And so I, I didn't want hand management. And, and so what I wanted was the same connection between a menu of actions, mm. I call them operations and special activities, mm. and events that represent unpredictable or semi-predictable opportunities or dangers mm. that come up periodically. Mm. And now you can choose if, it's, if you have the initiative to focus on one or the other, just as in a CDG. Mm. So one card is coming up at a time. And then all I needed was a semi-random initiative system, and I may as well use the same cards coming up to drive mm -hmm. that, so the symbols on the cards, that um, can give you the, what's important, I thought, in guerrilla and counter-guerrilla operations, which is one of the main modes in mm -hmm. insurgency and counter-insurgency, mm -hmm. and that is who knows enough about the other, who has the inter information advantage to bring force to bear. And typically the government will sweep into an area of jungle, the insurgents will know the government is coming and protect themselves or get out from under that mm. attack, get off the X. But maybe the government has gotten the jump and manages to catch one of them. So there's this sort of semi-random um, shifting of, of initiative that becomes important to resolving the individual clashes. And so the symbols on the cards give an order to who's going to get the initiative. And I can also use those symbols to give certain factions an advantage in claiming certain events because they're associated in some way. Mm -hmm. And then um, a, a, a track, a marker track or cylinder track that shows you, well, if you spend your time doing very complex activities, full operations and special activities, then it gives your opponent a chance to take advantage of some other opportunity represented by the event and vice versa. And mm -hmm. that's it. Hmm. Yeah, but, but this is a great, great response because I had not considered so far that, um, yes, of, of course I know that heaven management is a part in, in card-driven games, that, that you wanted to remove a little bit from this abstraction and more closely focusing on the events on the, on the board, on the sit, uh, situation. So this is very interesting. And let me briefly, and Volker, of course, you, you can't really see this. Let me try to bring up Vessel here. Sure. And I can show a little bit what you just, just mentioned in, in, in an example at Gandhi. And let me see, show you this. So you are seeing the cards here. What is so interesting is that you have a small glimpse into the future. So you have the current card and you see which card is coming up next here. So this, in my opinion, is already very interesting. Then you seeing each card are having, is having two events, but you may only use one of it. And what Volko just mentioned, this Gandhi is a four player game. You see the four factions here at the top, the icons. And the order is from left to right. So let's assume the Congress, the, the orange ones here, are taking the event. Then you're moving their cylinder to this bo box here, first faction event. Which also means that the second eligible faction, here in this case the black ones, the re revolutionaries, they cannot use the event, but they have to. They have two choices. They could move their cylinder to this box here, doing an operation plus a special activity, which is still very strong, or they could pass. And when both factions have acted, they are moving their cylinders to this ineligible factions box, which means that for the next card, they can't act. So in my opinion, this is really sheer brilliance, this uh, card mechanic. So back to Volko. So I, did, I just wanted to show you this because I'm, I'm really in, in love with this uh, card mechanic. Um, but what else do you personally consider, Volko, um, for being important for the success of the series? Uh, well, it, you mentioned, um, first of all, that it, that it is a series. And I will say from the beginning, Gene, Gene Billingsley of GMT games. He was a little bit hesitant on the topic of Colombian counterinsurgency. He didn't, wasn't sure he could he could sell it. Uh, but when I told him I intended a series, that was for him actually already a plus. 
okay. from a point of view of, of marketability. Because with a series, it means if you invest and in maybe the, the first one you play is a little bit of a cold bath uh, effect, um, but the, 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 the mechanics are similar enough. The system you just showed about uh, initiative and activities and events and passing, for example, you will recognize that game to game. And so if you invest in one volume and you want to try some different settings, you get some payoff from your investment in terms of, of overcoming that rules burden. So that's a part of it. But I think uh, a big part of it also is, is, the, is the form. I mean, form is not only the substance and the function, but form of board games is really important. You know, it's just important to accessibility and to enjoyment that um, what it looks like and what it feels like Mm -hmm. transports us is 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 pleasant is exciting is funny is whatever the effect is that the designer is trying to achieve and so while i come out of a very traditional hex encounter war game mm -hmm. um community i guess um i i don't tend to design in that space because i try to learn from the, the beauty and the accessibility of the larger board gaming world. And so with the coin series, I had a number of, of objectives with a number of audiences. One, as I mentioned, was I wanted to bring these very frequent and I think extremely important consequential historical internal wars to a, a traditional war gaming audience that tended to play World War II and yeah. the American Civil War and mm -hmm. topics like that, um, to say, you know what, th that's interesting but so is insurgency in colombia let me show you so that was sort of one you know mm -hmm. i want to lure them in in one way but i also wanted to lure in folks who enjoy games that may not be may be fun to play but may not necessarily be about anything consequential mm -hmm. or may not even attempt very much to simulate anything and say you know insurgency and counterinsurgency in colombia it sounds like a very serious heavy topic how can it be fun mm -hmm. Let me show you. It's actually quite interesting to, mm. to simulate that, and it is fun. And so how do I, you know, lure somebody? Well, it has to, first, the first impression matters, right? Yes. And so if it looks attractive and like something you know, then that helps. And I, and I, I believe that that's worked. I believe that people have come to the coin series from games that are not like war games or conflict simulations at all. Mm. and discovered that they like something like that, even about a topic as perhaps ex obscure or um, serious and, and maybe even unpleasant as uh, uh, insurgency. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Uh, agree. And let me just bring up the image from the start screen here again, because this is from Fire in the Lake, and you see this game looks really nice. It has lots of wooden components. So it, it's not your typical hex and counter war game from the 70s, which looks immediately very complex and a little bit uglier than, than this one. So I think the components quality is, is one of the things. In my opinion, of course, you could also say, well, maybe a World War II topic uh, that is uh, well known is better for sales but maybe these topics because they haven't been gained a hundred times that this was also a factor so at least for me this was certainly a, a factor the crossover mechanics and in my opinion are are very important as well but how do you see the solo rules in these uh, games how important are these because see, now we have the colonial twilight i think is the title we have a two-player coin game we have a three-player yes. coin game but you started yes. with four-player uh, games and most of the coin games are four-player games how important do you see in today's wargaming or gaming community the solo rules yeah, uh, they turned out to be more important than we had, had realized. And that, including them, attempting that, because it was a very much an experiment in Andy and Abyss, Volume 1 in the series, to include solo bots to represent players. Um, that also was an outgrowth directly out of the game Labyrinth. And so just very quickly how that came about. Labyrinth mm, yeah, was a game that um, pits the U.S. and its friends against the jihadists, the terrorists. 
And Gene had the concern when he commissioned the game for me, he's, he was he had the concern nobody would want to play the terrorists. This was 2009, so still relatively recent. We're still in the thick of, of things with the global mm, war on yeah. terror. And that was his concern. And he, so he said, it, you know, if you have the guts, Volko, design a solitaire system so the player can play the United States and, you know, be the counter terrorist, not the terrorists. And then we can sell the game. And I said, well, OK, and I will try that. So I. I tried it and we did it because otherwise we thought we couldn't sell the game mm. very well. Now, I don't know that that became true because I think very quickly players said, well, where's the bot that lets me play the jihadists against the United States solitaire, right? So it wasn't so much that people didn't want to play one side or the other, but it was very much the case that, that people wanted that system to play fully solitaire in as much of an approximation as possible of playing the two-player game. So we went to Colombia, mm -hmm. and I knew that I was going to have wow. difficulty convincing wow. people based wow. on the topic, wow. right? I was knew I was going to have convi difficulty convincing, wow. you know, East Front wow. Panzer pushers they should try insurgency wow. in Colombia, mm -hmm. or wow. you know, Euro game. Wow you know, cabbage ah. growers, and I mean that in a loving way, mm -hmm. to play a game mm -hmm. about counterinsurgency. So every ah. trick I could think of to lure people in, ah. and one of them was the, the way it looks and the components, one of them was that it's going to be a series, ah. and another was, and you can play it four player, three player, two player, or one player, mm -hmm. if you want. Okay. And it was a challenge to myself also, because having done it for a two player game to create a bot for one of the sides, I thought, can I actually do three different bots and have it be operable, have it be something that approximates a multiplayer game experience with flowcharts running three out of four players. That was a challenge mm. that I that I that I that I took on. And again, as it turned out, for many people, the flowcharts were very cumbersome. It's a whole nother set of rules you have to learn on top of the basic multiplayer game. And they have the game to play in groups anyway as a social activity, so why would they mess with that? And for those, they can leave those things in the box, and that's wonderful. But it turned out there was also a large audience for whom this was the, the selling point. Mm -hmm. And if we didn't offer that, they were not in at all. And that is now then created that expectation that we do that for not only every game in the coin series, but for many, many uh, of GMT's catalog in general. There is mm. now, which was not the case when Andy and Abyss came out, there's now the expectation that you're going to enable me to play this game solitaire. Mm. Yeah, for, for me it's really interesting. We mentioned this here several weeks ago in an episode when we were talking about the pandemic and more of the popularity about of solo bots and solo modes. And I'm not a solo player and I love to play um, full player count because I have access via Vessel or TTS or Tabletopia to other players. But yes, there are enough players who love to play games solitaire for whatever uh, the reason is and that, that's fine. So, so yeah, interesting. But I've, I'm having a couple of uh, comments here. So. Yes, cabbage growers, that is a term that some people like, some not that much. <laughs> with, <laughs> Very nice. With, with respect. <laughs> with respect. And um, yeah, and, and people are, Tony, um, Tony is uh, mentioning this genre, so coin games uh, that you uh, created, along with, so he's saying this genre, along with Cold Worldly, is really taking game design to a new and intriguing space. Is this a growing genre? Do you think so, Volko? Is this a growing genre of film? I, I do think so. And while we are going to find, I mean, there's going to be, for example, coin series fatigue. You know, we're at volume, I think, 11. So, so at a certain point, it becomes harder and harder. And we have to be more and more original to convince somebody, yes, out of all the selection, there's a reason to have yet another um, volume. However, I don't think we have yet found the walls of that box. That is mm -hmm. to say of the, the market or the interest in this sort of thing, which is to say uh, a, a game that looks and feels like a very well-produced Euro game and also has within it a serious simulation model of of some complex 
activity, whether it's explicitly out of history or is a well-developed fantasy or science fiction world or is um, some other um, allegorical setting that has within it important dynamics typically of humanity of some mm -hmm. kind, of human society of some kind. And if I can and put the coin series into that as a, as a genre, as that kind of defines a genre, I think there is tremendous continued room for, for exploration and growth, yes. Wonderful. Yes, I, I agree. And Daniel here has also made a nice comment because Cole mentioned when he was doing Root, he initially mentioned coin was um, something he was looking at because uh, it's asymmetric. And yes, Daniel is right. Root has successfully tricked loads of people into playing a war game. <laughs> and I think this is also true for, for the coin series at the same time. So, so of course, coin was earlier, but Root is even looking graphically. It's, it's not looking like a war game at all. And, and you, it yes. could be a fantasy game with some four evil factions and have real hard and, and uh, strong artwork. But I think that that game route with the artwork that they uh, leader games uh, had chosen it is working very well. You see, wargaming these days is can be quite different. It, it doesn't have to be your, your panzer pushing in, in, in the World War II uh, yeah. front. And, and, and another example I would mention like that, although it's not it's not a multifactional game, although it plays very well, in my opinion, with four players, is the game War of the Ring, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. which now uses, of course, plastic uh, miniatures that can be beautifully painted. I, my, I painted my set all 204 mm -hmm. because the, the game design is so well done. The asymmetries in it are must have been extremely challenging to balance because you have built in a model of the fellowship's attempt to deliver the ring and the the you know Sauron's attempt to discover the fellowship while there is a war going on uh and it's really medieval operations if you look at mm -hmm. the, the model within the game um qu quite a compelling uh, uh war game built into that and that's all happening at the same time so there are different ways to each side has two different ways to win with um with different capabilities and then card events and capabilities thrown on top of that and 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 a novel system of dice to generate what what actions you can take and all of it um just fits together uh so well it's a war game to me it's in fact yeah. one of my favorite war games even though it's of course not history but because the tolkien world is such an explicit coherent environment mm. the game design takes the same approach under the hood i feel as the old Hex Encounter games. Yes. And that is, you cannot say that it's, well, here are some interesting things for players to do and some interesting mechanics, and now how should we dress it up? It yeah. isn't that at all, right? No. It is, how shall we represent the War of the Ring on the tabletop? How shall we simulate it? It's yeah. a conflict simulation yes. about a coherent world, and it just transports you into that world. Yeah, just like your your coin games, um, but but you opened up the coin series to other designers. Um, so, for example, when we saw Gandhi earlier, this game has been designed by Bruce Mansfield. So, what is your involvement and what is your role as serious designer? Because uh, the the rules booklet is saying serious designer Volker Runke. Are you looking at all the entries from other designers, or how do you handle this? So I do see I do see them all. Uh, we now have the very uh, talented Jason Carr at GMT, who is coordinating and running uh, submissions uh, and development and testing of the entire series. So he has his arms around everything, including a whole team of solitaire designers uh, for all of GMT, not just the coin series, called GMT1. Uh, and, and all of that grew, grew out, it's one of the things I'm most proud of actually, all of that grew out of the fact that right after the first volume, Andy and Abyss, I had designers or aspiring designers come forward and say, I could, you know, I could do 
a volume on this. And it was typically an idea that I never myself would have had. I mean, I originally thought I'm going to, I proposed to Gene, I'm going to do four volumes, Latin America, Africa, Middle East, and Southeast Asia. Mm-hmm. And I sort of had four conflicts in each of those. And I never got around to any after the first because immediately um, Jeff Grossman stepped forward and said, you know, you could do this in Cuba. And, I'm, and I said, well, I could, but you do it. <laughs> and uh, we, we did it mm-hmm. together. And it, and it went from there with, with Brian Train on Afghanistan mm-hmm. and so forth. And so because so I think right now my title really should be perhaps series creator. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is that's true. <laughs> that will always be true. Um, but uh, outside of um, Fall of Saigon, which Mark Herman mm-hmm. and I, together with Jason Carr and Bruce Mansfield and others, um, are about to have uh, hit the market an expansion for Fire in the Lake on Vietnam. Um, I am focusing my time on levy and campaign and other projects. Mm-hmm. And so I am in the loop. I'm in the conversation. Um, but it, uh, I'm so delighted that it really has a, a creative energy of its own now. Very good. And I know this is very difficult uh, to pick, but what is your personal favorite coin game? Can you say so or...? It is, it is very difficult. It's, you know, my children and my grandchildren. And so he just say, I mean, Andy and Abyss will always have a special place um, for me because it was the, it was the first one. And it was the one that we had to convince the world. This is something interesting. And so mm-hmm. I always get somebody's interested in, in my game about Columbia, just you know, mm-hmm. that little, um, that, that, that little thrill. Um, Falling Sky, I will mention, which mm-hmm. is um, Caesar in Gaul as a, as a four player um, ancient insurgency, counterinsurgency, if you will. That one's very special because it's a co design with my son Andrew. And very good. Uh, as you can imagine, yeah. sharing a hobby with your children is wonderful. Um, sharing a design project uh, with, with your child is, is something uh, you never forget. Yes, of course. And there's a question by Matt. Hello, Matt. If someone has never played a coin game, which one should they play first, in your opinion? Uh, so a typical suggestion is Cuba Libre, because it is, it's volume two, so it's still very much at the beginning and has the core systems uh, representative and intact. It's also quite small. Mm-hmm. Um, there are only 10, 10 spaces. Um, and is, has been described as a, uh, a, a night fight in a phone booth. It gets to the action very quickly and, and, it, and it's tight. So Cuba Libre is one that's mentioned. I would mention Andean Abyss because because it was the first, it has the fewest adornments. Mm-hmm. I think there we had to be the most disciplined to keep it straightforward because it was already so different from mm-hmm. what the market was expecting. Um, and from the and Falling Sky, because it's not as reliant on um, popular support, and there's a, a mm-hmm. set of mechanisms that are associated with modern counterinsurgency that we don't need here, mm-hmm. be, because it's in ancient times. Also has some advantages of of simplicity in that way. However, that's balanced with a more complicated uh, combat system than the earlier ones. The bottom line is there's not that much difference in mm-hmm. how accessible all of them are. We, we try to say, well, if you're buying a game that's in the corn series, you're getting a certain level mm-hmm. of, of complicatedness and not more than that and not less than that. Mm-hmm. So they're not that different. And the, the settings really are very different. And they're made even more distinct by the fact that, as you mentioned, there are different designers or teams of designers and developers on each one. Mm -hmm. And so as you look at them, what setting is most appealing? What's most interesting? If you're just not interested in modern counterinsurgency and you'd rather go to older times, then choose Pendragon or Falling Sky or Liberty or Death. Um, If you, if you want the most modern day situation, then maybe a distant plane, which is Afghanistan. If you want what is the most famous insurgency and counterinsurgency in U.S. history, it really is Vietnam, then, then fire in the lake and so on. Yeah. And Daniel here in the chat is confirming he's saying Cuba Libre is the one I here mentioned the most. And um, there's also Ben. Hello, Ben, by the way. Um, he's having a question. Is there a thematic twist to some of the base game mechanisms that you are particularly proud or happy of adding in one of the coin series? 
Oh, well, there's, um, yeah, so many to, to think of, but I, um, I am very interested in older conflicts, actually. Um, so the pathway for me to doing very modern topics like Labyrinth was one that grew out of my day job and out of the commission from Gene to do a game about jihadism. But actually, my original love is older military history. And so when we go back in time and we look for what was similar or different about um, rebellion in ancient times or in the in the uh, in the dark ages, those are the twists, I guess, that are closest to my heart. So, for example, in in Falling Sky, the same mechanics that establish insurgent bases, guerrilla bases, which are logistics and mm -hmm. political cadre and that sort of thing in modern times, we use to represent uh, allied tribes in Gaul, mm -hmm. either allied with, with Caesar or allied with the uh, Averni Confederation and so forth. And it works very well, actually, to represent something that's quite different and is, is actually more... Um, or at least as political as it is logistical, mm -hmm. um, and yet that the the you don't have to learn a new mechanic mm -hmm. to use it. Um, in the context of of that game, it represents the shifting alliances of the individual tribes of Gaul actually very well. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. In my view. Yeah, <laughs> and um, of course, Volko is not only the designer of the Cohen series for GMT. But he has also done one game so far in the Levy and Campaign series. And the title is Nevsky, Toy Tones and Rust in Collision 1240 to 1242. And this uh, here is the, uh, you, if you, maybe you can see it at the background booklet of the series. And frankly, I haven't played the game yet, um, so you know I'm bad. But what got me interested in this series is the fact that you are not portraying, like some other games, Middle Age battles, but Middle Age operations. And here you need, in, in Inevsky, you need to raise, equip, and provision your army. So I think this is fascinating. What, but what got you interested in this period of time? So why a game on Nevsky? And, yeah, thank you. And so many, many um, origins. And one is that I remember a uh, a course in college on on English constitutional uh, history, actually, and this idea that um, early laws were based on obligations of military service, which were time limited. You had to, you know, depending on your status, you had to show up with ten men with spears, helmets, and serve for forty days. And it just raised the question for me, what happens when the 40 days is up? I mean, it doesn't mean that the campaign is over or the war is over. And how do you get from that system to paying people to fight longer or somehow obligating them? And so I wanted to have a game where that issue of limited time service of troops came into play. And up into... I mean, including the American Revolutionary War, the fact that the troops would go home at the end of the year, their mm -hmm. service was up, really mattered in terms of whether you attacked or not, or whether you could sustain your effort. And I didn't see that represented very well in mm -hmm. the, the games as they existed. So that was one part. The second part was to, again, coming from the feudal system and the nature, the personal nature of the command and control system and how we might show that. And I thought I had a good uh, mechanic that I could steal from another game that would portray this not very reliable communications system based on individual loyalties to try to organize a campaign. And all of that would serve to represent what, what you just described, which I think is, is really uh, underrepresented. And yes. that is this operational level of activity between the individual battles, the tactical, which is always very famous and we have, you know, many games about, mm -hmm. and the strategic, the grand strategic with diplomacy and, and the affairs of, of nations and so forth. Um, in, in feudal times, so many of the conflicts were rather sm smaller scale and the logistical command, uh, technological systems actually were quite interesting and sophisticated and there was just a lot there to explore and represent and so i thought i could easily um fill a series full 
mm. of such topics uh, uh, regarding medieval military operations. I started with Nevsky mainly because um, a part of my family heritage is nearby, that my father was born in East Prussia. Mm-hmm. And so I just have a, an interest in that part of the world and wanted to see more games about it. And here's one. And you speak German, right, Volko? This is richtig, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> probably better than I'm, uh, and definitely better than my English. So, but that's no, not I, that hard. Absolutely, uh, <laughs> no, quite the opposite. Uh, no, 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 it, it isn't. But I'm having a great support here in in the chat because uh, people are already offering me to play Nevsky by Vessel. So that's wonderful. Oh, and Stefan is is saying we can play it. But actually, I had a couple of months ago, I had scheduled a game with Phil, uh, whom I'm also seeing here, the true Spielpunk. Um, and we had scheduled a game, uh, but for some reason, probably one of us uh, had, to, had to take, uh, had to get out of this uh, on, on short notice. So, so I will play this game. I can, I can say it. I have the Nevsky and I will learn the rules. I will play it. And I'm, I'm sure I'm, I'm enjoying uh, this. But what will be the next game in this series, uh, Volko? Because it's a series, it's not a single game. So what will be next? So the next uh, game takes us to the opposite corner of medieval Europe, and it's set in the Reconquista of Spain, and specifically uh, two years of the 11th century. So the Reconquista was over 700 years, right? Mm -hmm. So if you were to do a game on it, and there are games on it, you'd be doing a very grand strategic. But if we're going to do an operational campaign, we're talking about we could pick out out of all that history just two years that would be interesting. So it happens to be in the 11th century when the Christian kingdoms became quite unified under uh, King Alfonso VI of Leon. And he uh, takes a major step forward for the Christians and captures a great uh, central Muslim uh, emirate or taifa Mm -hmm. of Toledo. And there's a reaction from the Muslims who pull together and invite a massive um, North African fundamentalist army, Almoravidun, or the Almoravids. And so the game is Almoravid, and it is that that great clash. And so we have a bigger map and mm. bigger forces and a much better developed road system. Old Roman mm. roads are still being maintained. And Moorish fortifications, stone fortifications everywhere that are very tough. But gentler seasons and weather and less concern with, with winter and mud than you have in Nevsky. So we take the same uh, core mechanics and we put them in a setting with uh, different social economic state, uh, different cultures, different politics, um, different uh, uh, geographic environment, but you have the same basic mechanics of limited service, lords um, levying one another, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, and then simple simulation of battles. There are, of course, battles. Mm-hmm. The main issue is the formation and maintenance of the armies, as you as you say, but it does represent, does result in battles that you fight out. So that's Almoravid uh, volume two. And one thing that happened there, again, I had envisioned my series of four <laughs> and I was going to do the four corners. I was going to do um, Nevsky in the Northeast, um, Longshank, Scotland in the in the Northwest uh, corner, then something in Spain is volume three. And finally uh, something in uh, to do with the Crusades in the Holy Land is volume four be done. But I uh, uh, met um, a Spanish war gamer named Albert Allegre Hove, um, who had heard me mention, and he started to give me some ideas. And he ended, he is now the researcher for Almoravid. And we have a marvelous, mostly Spanish team wow, of good. researchers, artists, mm-hmm. um, and testers um, on Almoravid. Uh, and so I just had to take, you know, that opportunity to say, okay, we're going to do Spain right now. Mm. And now we have, uh, I have about a half dozen other designers, we don't know how many will finish, but working on different Levian campaign volumes in different settings of, of medieval Europe and the Near East. Mm. So I have one or two more questions and comments, but let me briefly post the URL of this game here. So if you are interested in it, you can follow up here. So that's a BGG page link to this one and and yeah it sounds great so so you're getting um positive feedback here and and matze from spieletreffen verteiler is saying volko thank you for the perfect german so that's also uh, <laughs> important so that's a confirmation and matt is asking 
Do you always conceive games as serious? So is this your general approach? Uh, it, I think it is a, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a useful approach if you think you have a new niche and you've just picked a sample out. So there are so few uh, games about insurgency that it was clear to me I could make a series of that. And I had the same view of medieval operations. Now, another game that's not yet on offer um, that may or may not be a series, and so mm -hmm. the answer may be no, is a little game called Hunt for Blackbeard. Mm -hmm. And what it is about is it's not really a war game. It's a simulation of manhunting. Mm -hmm. But in this case, of course, in the context of 18th century pirate hunting, mm -hmm. It could be a hunt series. One could do, and I have in mind what mm -hmm. might be done, but who knows? We first need to get, uh, have Hunt for Blackbird be a published reality, and that is still mm -hmm. a ways away um, to see. And it may end up being, uh, even if it succeeds, a, a, a one-off game. Okay. But, but that's really the question is, is there, is there unexploited terrain there? You know, are we doing something that is new enough that uh, that it will sustain a series substantively. That's mm -hmm. really the, the heart of the matter. Hmm. Interesting. So are we having a final comment or are we closing this down here? So I think we are we are done here. And Volko, from my point of view, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. And uh, please check out uh, all the coin series games. Check out the GMT page. Check out the BGG pages. And you got some information which games, if you haven't played a coin game so far, which may be a good introductory game. Check out Nevsky, so the Levy and Campaign series. I think it's fascinating here because it's really something that hasn't gained at all before. And you see it's also serious. So learn the rules once and you, are, you have most of the rules ready for, for the next game. And um, yeah, next game, uh, next game, next week, this will be a regular uh, episode with me presenting some Spielworks and industry news. And if you are having um, some questions, please uh, mail them in advance. Or if you have a topic that you would like to discuss, drop me an email at uli at spielworks.de. That is uli at spielworks.de. And again, Bolko, thank you so much. Thanks, Lily. Thanks all. This was great fun. Yeah, thank you. And till then, bleib gesund. Black Lives Matter. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs> yeah.